Right, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Can I start by welcoming you to the first meeting of the uh, session? And uh, it's particularly fitting this afternoon uh, to have as our speaker Rachel Burnett, our chairman. And rather than uh, have the slight embarrassment of having to introduce herself, uh, she sent me a day or so ago, uh, would you mind uh, introducing me? So, uh, I, it's my pleasure this afternoon, therefore, to welcome Rachel as our speaker, and thank you uh, in advance for uh, coming, uh, preparing the, the, the talk for us. As you know, the subject for this afternoon is adapting and innovating the development of IT law. And uh, this is an area that uh, Rachel has specialised in for, uh, year, for uh, a number of years, and she's currently the head of the ITIP law team at Paris Smith's uh, Solicitors. And uh, she also uh, works uh, in the set on the same topics with the Open University. And um, I suppose if you doubt her credentials, I will show you the thickness. It's a typical law book, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, but let me just uh, say to you, uh, it's called Drafting and Negotiating Computer Contracts. It's the book that I think most of us over the years wish we had had at the time. Uh, and uh, Rachel is one of the two uh, co-editors of the book. And uh, this uh, is the second edition. And if you're thinking of buying it for Christmas, uh, maybe you should wait a month or two because the third edition uh, is coming out uh, next year. So um, that's Rachel's uh, book to just prove uh, that uh, the, uh, her involvement in the topic if we needed to. But it's a pleasure, Rachel, to welcome you here. Thank you. And we look forward now to your presentation, Adapting and Innovating, the Development of IT Law. Thank you, Roger. Good afternoon. I'm going to discuss how laws responded to IT's continuing innovation and societal transformation to create a distinct body of IT law. I don't know of any publication or presentation before that has taken this direct approach in establishing a relationship, and thanks to Roger Johnson for suggesting it. Here is a structure I've devised. I begin by defining my terms, first the IT landmarks, event and developments that I see as triggers, then to explain the nature of law to be able to discuss how it develops, and then I go through some different areas of IT law which have been most significantly affected by computers or which have impacted them to explain how, and of course it has to be selective. As I go through with some of the challenges going forward for us as computer professionals, as users and lawyers, challenges, contrasts and tensions. Unless you're really puzzled by anything, it's probably better for us to have a discussion or for you to contradict me or ask questions at the end. For my first controversial assertion, here is the chronology of what I think are the principal relevant IT landmarks, events and developments which you should have as a handout. I won't go through them now because I'll be referring to them as, as relevant as I go along to explain why they're significant. You may not agree with my selection and you may not agree with the dates, but this is where I'm starting from. For the nature of law, a quotation from an introduction to law by Phil Harris. The law is never static. It is always changing, being reinterpreted or redefined as regulators and judges strive with varying degrees of success to ensure that the law constantly reflects changes in society itself. That is to say, in response to societal and cultural developments, including IT. And there are two ways in which it does this, as we shall see, by adaptation or innovation. And the areas we are going to go through will illustrate both aspects. For example, the law on forming a legal contract has adapted. Contracts generally do not have to be made in writing, with certain exceptions, one of which is that a guarantee must be in writing and signed by the guarantor, 
under the Statute of Frauds, which dates from 1677. But a recent court case has established that an exchange of emails between two parties can meet these requirements to create a legal guarantee. The courts adapted old law to new means of communication. By contrast, novel law has been created to deal with computer misuse. This is one set of contrasts. Another is that law may be perceived as restrictive, and this is the normal view, that it's preventive, that it forbids certain activities, for example, in inhibiting the unregulated use of personal information about us under the Data Protection Act. Yet law may conversely be perceived as enabling to help us achieve our objectives against other parties or protecting individual rights, for example, to enable us to choose whether our personal information should be kept private. Another dichotomy is in the English legal system between law being certain, but law also having to be flexible to deal with societal, cultural and technological change. Law, legal jurisdiction, is always based on territory. And before I return to the implications of that, I want to talk about the sources of English law, which are relevant for how law is made and changed, because my talk is really about English law. That's what I'm trained in. That's what I practice. There are one or two occasions where I'll be referring to other aspects, but, but really it's, it's on English law. In England and Wales, we have what's known as a common law system by comparison with civil law systems such as most continental or other European Union member states, or to some extent Scotland. And the principal sources of English law are by means of legislation, Acts of Parliament, or statutes such as the Data Protection Act. And these laws are like a structure or framework. However, cases decided at court can also change the law. This is the common law in operation. It means that many of our primary legal principles have been made and developed by judges rather than by parliament from case to case in what's called a system of precedent. Interpreting the law by actual examples where lower courts, like the High Court, follow principles established by higher courts, such as the Court of Appeal. The cases may be about interpreting legislation made in Parliament. For example, the courts have made the meaning of personal data clearer, the term used in the Data Protection Act. Or the courts may refine decisions made in earlier cases where there is no legislation. So that in the UK there is no Act of Parliament saying that certain information must be confidential, apart from legislation on personal data. Confidential information has been defined and refined over time by the judges who decide in the particular circumstances brought before them and on previous decisions whether the information concerned should be specially protected. And many of the cases are interesting stories of the law in practice. Our judge-made law has been likened to poetry. Each is said to be an unwieldy, ramshackle, rich body of interwoven documentation founded on Latin but packed with the detritus of other languages, formed not so much by diktat or politics as by thousands of individual eccentric judgments and egregious cases. As well as our sources of, be of law being through Parliament and the courts, in the United Kingdom, as in the other member states of the European Union, the EU, it is necessary to take into account the increasing effect of EU laws. For example, the EU's Data Protection Directive was implemented in the UK by the Data Protection Act. The overall aim of almost all EU legislation is to harmonise the varying laws between the EU in order to promote economic and social progress. Consequently, there's considerable harmonisation of laws relating to IT and the internet in the EU. Beyond the EU, to facilitate international trade, countries have always made agreements with each other, known as treaties or conventions. For example, the Bern Convention is the most widely observed international treaty relating to copyright. The convention originated in 1886, long before computers were invented or software first created. It has been adapted to deal with software. I said that legal systems are based on territory, 
different political societies have different laws and different ways of balancing opposing interests and of organizing justice, and there are well over 200 jurisdictions. Basically, however, national law and jurisdiction apply, even for online activities which may be global. And the immediacy of e-communications brings this to the fore. Whenever an internet website advertises goods or services or a purchase is made over the net or by email, jurisdiction issues may arise. The effect of different cultural perspectives is illustrated by the lawsuit began in the year 2000, brought in the French courts by two civil liberties groups against Yahoo, the American portal search engine and directory company, for selling Nazi memorabilia on the yahoo.com website. No such items were for sale on the French website. It's illegal in France to display or sell things which incite racial hatred. The French courts ordered Yahoo to block internet users in France from accessing the site containing such memorabilia and find it for non-compliance. But one of the grounds of Yahoo's defense was the principle that the decision would infringe its constitutional rights to free speech in the US and was therefore unenforceable. That a French court had no right to say what the content of US-based sites should be. Yahoo sought a legal declaration in the US to this effect from a federal court in California. However, on appeal by the civil rights groups in 2006, the US Supreme Court decided to hear the case, declined to hear the case. And so, this illustrates an unsatisfactory cross-jurisdictional legal result. Anyway, Yahoo subsequently decided to cease trading in these kinds of goods. So there was a pragmatic outcome, having used law, but not actually effectively achieved an actual legal result. The areas of IT law that I'm going to look at are contract, copyright and patent, confidentiality, personal data protection and privacy, compliance, there's increasing regulation, competition and crime. The first book on computer law was written in 1978. These are the landmarks that I shall refer to as important for the development of IT contracts, which is the first topic I'm going to take. So that's in 1952, 1969, and just generally, always, contracts are evolving. So from 1952 or so, mass-produced computers were supplied for commercial and industrial use. And the higher the charges for purchasing, leasing, or maintenance of computers, or anything else, the more the supply contract will be drafted specifically and negotiated. But things really took off when in 1969, IBM took the decision to charge separately for systems engineering, training, and software, unbundling, rather than supplying everything together. From then on, a distinct software industry has evolved with a need to protect its software assets and to provide systems or supply through the channel of value-added products and services. There's now a myriad of specialised IT contracts for specific purposes, focusing on services and combinations of services and value-added components as hardware and to some extent software has become commoditised. The development, testing and licensing of applications and the implementation of a remarkable number of distribution arrangements. A whole array of agreements caters for related areas such as marketing, business continuity and so on. Contracts may be between organisations in different jurisdictions in the channel of supply. The international business context brings law and jurisdiction clauses of the contract and the enforceability of it into sharp focus. I shall mention licensing agreements later, but I spend a very large part of my working life as a solicitor in drafting and negotiating specifically IT contracts. The more business there is, and the greater the number of contracts, or at least transactions and relationships not always reflected in properly drafted legal contracts, as time goes on, there will be disputes. 
There have been various high-profile litigation disputes over IT contracts, often on standard terms and conditions, and sometimes where there is nothing or very little, often nothing at all, where the parties are arguing over whether there even was a contract to cover the problems that arose. Typical cases are where the contractual relationship has broken down because of the mismatch over the mutual expectations of the roles of the parties or over complete failure to supply a system, or a failure to meet the whole of the specification. Arguments over the extent of liability by the supplier, and whether contractual limits were justified. I'm going to illustrate contractual disputes arising over unreasonable and unfulfilled promises by the supplier, encouraging the customer to enter into the contract. This is an example of the law adapting by applying the existing law on misrepresentation to IT arrangements. Some of you may remember the computer manufacturer Wang. The customer in this case, which came to court in 2000, wanted a tried and tested IT solution for its plumber's business. Wang made a pre-contractual misrepresentation in trying to win the business that the standard software was a perfect fit and low risk solution. Some of us will have heard these not unfamiliar kinds of assertions before. The implementation failed for many reasons, including Wang's extensive breaches of contract and the customer never got a system. The judge described Wang's performance as disastrous. The contract price was just over £1 million, but the customer was awarded over £9 million damages plus another £5 million in costs and additional expenses. And the consequence was that Wang went into voluntary liquidation as a direct result. I'm going to mention just one more recent case because B Sky B and EDS is one of the largest IT cases ever to come to trial. The case involved over 110 days in court, more than half a million documents and 70 witnesses. B Sky B sued EDS, alleging breach of contract and that EDS had misrepresented its expertise and resources to win a tender to build a customer relationship management CRM system for B Sky B's new call centre for £48 million. EDS missed various delivery dates. Sky took over and completed the build itself. EDS's failures resulted in implementation being delayed by five years and Sky spending an additional £200 million. The claim made by B Sky B was originally for about £700 million against EDS since taken over by HP Enterprise Services UK. Sky alleged that EDS had made a number of false representations which had induced Sky to select EDS for the project, including fraudulent misrepresentations, the worst, deceit, deliberate lies going beyond exaggeration or sales talk, normally very hard to prove. Enter the dishonest salesman. Joe Galloway had been managing director of EDS's CRM practice and was the lead salesman on the bid. He had represented to Sky that the dates for implementation were based on a proper assessment of the time that it would take to build the system. However, he perjured himself in the witness box about his qualifications. He repeatedly lied about having an MBA degree from Concordia College in the US Virgin Islands. There was no such college. Mr. Galloway had in fact bought his degree on the internet. One of Skye's barristers applied online for the same degree for his dog, a miniature schnauzer called Lulu. <laughs> The application was successful. <laughs> Lulu the dog not only obtained a degree, but was awarded higher marks than Mr. Galloway. <laughs> <laughs> the judge held that Mr. Galloway demonstrated an astounding ability to be dishonest, and that his credibility was completely destroyed by his perjured evidence over a prolonged period, and reflected his propensity to be dishonest whenever he sees it in his interest in his business dealings. The finding was that EDS had never carried out a proper assessment of the time that the system would take, as Mr. Galloway had claimed. He was solely responsible for deliberately lying that EDS could deliver within Sky's deadline, 
to win the contract. It's not possible to exclude or limit liability for fraudulent misrepresentation, so the limitation of liability provision in the contract of £30 million didn't apply. Sky initially, as I say, claimed over £700 million in damages for a contract originally worth about £48 million, and eventually damages were settled at an overall inclusive total of £318 million. Moving on now to copyright, and there are more dates here which I think are triggers for reactions in the law um, to, uh, which are relevant really for copyright, intellectual property rights, but mainly copyright. So 1952, 1969, 75, 81, 91, 2000 and 2004, really. And then I just want to set the context for intellectual property rights as a whole. The World Trade Organization defines them as rights given to people over the creation of their minds. Creation, creators can be given the right to prevent others from using their inventions, designs, or other creations. And so copyright and patent are intellectual property rights. Technology is also concerned with registered and unregistered design rights and trademarks, but I'm not going to say anything more about those. Um, I can't say much more about copyright. But the law of intellectual property rights, particularly copyright, is continually remodified, re-evaluated and reinterpreted to adapt to the constant technological changes that there are. I've just mentioned patents briefly. Patent law is applied to computing technologies in the same way as to other inventions in the UK and Europe. There is a divergence with patent law in the US insofar as software as such and business methods are more readily patentable in the United States and cannot be patented in the EU and in the UK. But software with a technical effect may be and is. But this means that software, certainly most application software, is protected by copyright in the same way as literary and dramatic and musical works, including graphical content, sound recordings, and other recorded performances. The law via EU legislation from 1991 and case law has adapted to protect most software as intellectual property, by analogy with literary works. Like all intellectual property rights, it's created by the laws of a country, and therefore criteria will differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Copyright protects the expression of an idea. It is literally the right to copy. Therefore, someone who copies copyright material without authorization from the copyright holder is infringing or breaching copyright. Ownership of the intellectual property belongs first to the creator of the original work, unless the creator is an employee when the employer owns the rights, unless there's a transfer of ownership in writing. But commercially, software is licensed instead to one or more often to many users so that the owner retains ownership and can control the use of the software by imposing conditions of use as part of the license. The importance of software licensing for profit is illustrated by the operating system for the first IBM PC. In 1980, IBM was in search of an operating system for its PC that it was developing. Bill Gates had already bought the rights to an operating system for his company's use. Microsoft developed the system further and renamed it MS-DOS. IBM became its first licensee, calling the system PC-DOS for a one-time fee of about $80,000, giving IBM the royalty-free right to use the operating system forever. This is one of the earliest examples in the software industry of promoting strategic value by means of a giveaway bargain and was the foundation of Microsoft's success. IBM had not bought the rights. IBM did not have an exclusive license. Subsequent makers of machines similar to the IBM PC, like Dell and Compaq, also needed MS-DOS. Again, Microsoft licensed it to them on Microsoft's terms. 
There is a recent decision from the Court of Justice of the EU, the ECJ, in a case brought by SAS to confirm that the business functionality of a computer program and the program language and format of data files do not constitute forms of expression of that program and so are not protected by copyright. The purchaser of a software license is normally automatically entitled to observe, study or test the software functioning so as to determine the ideas and principles which underlie that program. An earlier case was brought in the English courts against EasyJet, which had written its own replacement airline flight reservation system for ticketless booking. EasyJet deliberately decided that its own system should have the same look and feel as the main system in the market at that time, owned by Navitaire. But it had no access to Navitaire's source code. It wasn't a case of literal copying. EasyJet admitted that its new software copied the business logic of Navitaire's software with almost identical user functions. The courts held that the software business logic was not protected. Copying the individual command codes entered by the users to achieve particular results, defining commands and their syntax to define a computer language, was not infringement. Copyright works may easily be transmitted, downloaded and digitally manipulated over the internet, social media channels as well. Copying, including peer-to-peer -peer file sharing to distribute music or films over the internet, without the permission of the copyright holder, is illegal. It's often referred to as digital piracy and has been of concern to copyright owners and governments for years. A report earlier this week identified Manchester as the piracy capital of the UK, closely followed by Nottingham and Southampton. There are apparently more illegal downloads per person in the city than any other in the country. For the press, Newspapers are held liable for publication, for copyright infringement and for defamation, as well as the author. But the Royal Mail is not held liable for copyright infringement or defamation in the content of the letters they deliver. Likewise, intermediary service providers, ISPs, are not generally held to be responsible for the actions of their users. This is as a result of e-commerce legislation in the year 2000 from the EU. They will not be liable for transmitting or temporarily storing illegal material, provided that they did not initiate or modify the transmissions, select the receivers, or select or modify the information. If they're made aware of the inf offending information or illegal activity, they must remove it promptly or disable access to it. For this passive role of ISPs in channeling information or providing access to a communications network, the technical term is that they are a mere conduit, that is, that they are acting only as intermediaries. Controversial UK legislation, the Digital Economy Act 2010, aims to tackle the problem of identifying online copyright infringers, in particular those involved in illegal file sharing. A scheme was introduced for the largest ISPs in this, <coughs> at least the Act introduced scheme, who run fixed internet access to be required to warn subscribers whose IP addresses are reported to them by copyright owners as infringing that they are breaking the law and should stop. For a subscriber who's been warned on more than three occasions within 12 months, the ISP is required to provide the copyright owner with details to enable legal action to be taken against the infringer. The legislation also empowers the government to introduce a requirement for ISPs to take more stringent measures, such as limiting internet access for offenders. The ISPs took the government to court over the terms of the Act, but did not win. The scheme is supposed to come into effect when Ofcom has drawn up a code with the details of how the procedure will work, but it's only recently set out its proposals. Meanwhile, copyright owners have succeeded in obtaining a court order to require ISPs to block access to a website on grounds of copyright infringement, which has led to others. The website, Newsbin2, provided links for its members to illegally copied material, including films found on Usenet discussion forums. The action was brought by six American film production companies or studios, who are owners or exclusive licensees of copyrights in films and television programs. 
It was supported by other organisations representing other copyright holders' interests. BT was one of the ISPs concerned. BT told the applicants that it did not support or condone copyright infringement, but to avoid business exposure and potential liability, it required a court order before it would block a service. BT prefers this approach where the defendants have been found in breach of copyright rather than the interventionist approach for ISPs specified in the Digital Economy Act. Rights holders can therefore prevent online infringement by this means and cause the infringing material to be cut off at source. There are discussions currently going on in the EU about this kind of online copyright infringement and what to do about it for EU law. But where does the balance lie? When should intermediaries face liability and how far should they be forced to cooperate in the process of identifying anonymous users? In discussing intellectual property rights in relation to IT, there is a tension between creativity and control. There's a value in supporting artistic creativity through protecting artistic creators' rights. But this has to be balanced against encouraging innovation in developing new communication technologies, and these may conflict. I'm now moving on to confidentiality, data protection, and privacy. And again, from 1952, there are various points at which uh, technologies have developed for a reaction from the law. And here, very much the growth of data storage capacity and the ease of storage and transmission have affected uh, confidentiality and data protection and privacy. The proliferation of information available to businesses, governments and other organisations is immense and constantly growing. Technologies transform the collection, collation, dissemination and use of information and turned it into a commodity which can be profitably traded, for example through online commercial databases. It's very easy to access, store, retrieve, copy, analyse, alter and reuse information. And there are many kinds of information which are important for an IT business to keep confidential, such as financial information, information in connection with a joint business or marketing venture, certainly technological details, and for example when a close evaluation of a computer system or any other intellectual property material is being undertaken, or customer details. The law doesn't protect any information simply because it's labelled confidential. It must meet specific criteria to be regarded as protectable at law. Non-disclosure agreements are much more useful and should be supported by technical means and care about disclosing the information in the first place. I should mention briefly the EU database right. This is a new law right, this is innovation. It applies only within the European economic area now that databases can be created, maintained and updated electronically and are so commercially important. Databases where the contents have been selected or arranged with some kind of intellectual creativity will be protected by copyright. But other databases, such as customer lists, football or other sporting fixtures, will be protected by the database right. The database right holder can prevent others from extracting or reusing the database contents without permission. Personal data is a special category of information whose obtaining, processing, use and storage is regulated at law. It consists, data protection consists of legal rules granting rights to us as citizens on how our personal data should be processed. And data protection became important precisely because of the increased capacities for computer data storage and processing. And it was the increasing use of computers in the 1970s which prompted concerns about the risks they posed to privacy. In 1981, the Council of Europe Convention established standards among member countries to ensure the free flow of information among them without infringing personal privacy. This led to the first EU Data Protection Directive 
and to our first act of 1984, which established basic general principles for protecting personal data. Then came the 1998 Data Protection Act, also as a result of a, a, an EU directive. And this was not limited only to computer-held personal data. It had the explicit aim of protecting the right to privacy for personal data. And that was the first time for such a law in the UK. Amongst other things, it specified conditions for processing personal data, tightened restrictions on the use of particularly sensitive information, such as health data, and set out controls for the transfer of personal data outside the European economic area. Changes are being proposed to data protection law, including the publication of the draft EU data protection regulation last January. The arguments are that the increased use of the internet, technological advances such as the growth of cloud computing and the growth of global e-commerce have all brought fresh legal challenges. For instance, social networking sites like Facebook have become a major cause of privacy concerns. Consumer awareness of rights in relation to data protection has increased. Complaints to the Information Commissioner have arisen in relation to marketing emails, the disclosure of bank details, inaccurate personal data, and the unauthorised disclosure of personal data. And as a result, privacy itself has changed. The emphasis of privacy is not so much about keeping our personal information secret, but is shifting instead to our controlling how it should be used. We should be able as individuals to control for ourselves how the information is used and by whom and to identify when misuse has occurred. And for this, we need a better privacy enabling infrastructure. It's impossible to prevent access to information as WikiLeaks has demonstrated to the world's governments, but it will be possible to render individuals, organizations and governments more accountable for how that information is used and have meaningful sanctions. The Human Rights Act incorporated a large part of the European Convention on Human Rights, the ECHR, and we were one of the earliest signatories to this in 1951. Privacy conflicts with freedom of speech, national security, police powers of surveillance, freedom of information, e-commerce, and so on. And the balance that's coming before the courts is the tension between Article 8 the right to respect for people's privacy, including homes and correspondence, as against Article 10, freedom of expression. But these are qualified rights, not absolute rights, so it all depends on the circumstances. The Human Rights Act is not the only driving force behind developments on the law of privacy. There are views that privacy has come under greater pressure in recent years, which has created a new law need for a new law on privacy, and technology also has created a need for further law on privacy as cameras and surveillance equipment have become more sophisticated. You will have noticed that the law on privacy has developed generally in relation to the media, and this clearly has an IT angle when injunctions to prevent media reporting are breached on the internet as well as in the House of Parliament. The modern law of privacy isn't concerned merely only with information or secrets. It's also concerned, importantly, with intrusion. So this area of privacy is still very young. It's still very active. There's much debate and possibilities for legal development. So we probably haven't yet got the right balance between identity anonymity on the one hand and the public interest on the other, between transparency and privacy. Next to compliance, and email is one example where increasing regulation has come to be significant. Of course, the internet and the World Wide Web and then the fact that everybody, a lot of us, most people, now we've got ubiquitous computing and social media channels. So I'm going to discuss some online regulation. 
The anarchic early days of the internet could be said to be dominated by the creativity of technological innovation, by people often acting primarily from independent personal curiosity and scientific experiment. But because the technology has been so very successful and pervasive, commercial and business interests have moved in. And this is what has led to more and more regulation. Before e-commerce came the law on distance selling. And this is another example of laws emanating from the EU. And this law was originally implemented before the internet had become a channel for purchasing. And it was to apply to sales between consumers and suppliers of goods and services by parties not physically present in the same place at the same time. And of course, it's adapted seamlessly to email and website contracts. Consumers purchasing in the EU have the right to basic e pre-contract information on sale details, prices, payment, terms and conditions, and confirmation of their orders, with certain exceptions. The right to cancel a distance contract without explanation or penalties, and delivery within 30 days unless otherwise agreed. The EU introduced e-commerce legislation back in the year 2000 to provide a basic framework to facilitate the development of information society services, harmonising the different regimes across member states, encouraging e-trading and boosting consumer confidence. And this is new law, specifically for technology developments. And it was this legislation that introduced the exemption from liability for ISPs, referring to them as mere conduits. Providers of online services throughout the EU are regulated in the geographic location where they are established, and that means the place where the supplier pursues an economic activity through a fixed establishment, irrespective of the location of the website or the servers. It's the country of origin basis. And the aim is to ensure that service providers need comply only with one set of laws, at least in respect of their status and registration, those with which they should be most familiar, rather than the laws of 27 member states. Providers of information society services must make information about themselves and their activities available online. Information about rights, obligation and dispute resolution for e-commerce must be available via organisations such as Consumer Direct and the Citizens Advice Bureau. These provisions are intended to meet transparency requirements for consumer confidence and fair trading and to increase use of e-commerce. However, the extent to which they work in practice across jurisdictions is limited. A complaint by a UK user about a non-compliant website where the trader is a company, partnership or individual based in the UK may be addressed within the UK as a consumer. But if the website's outside the UK, even within the EU, there's no simple way for a UK user to resolve any problem. Uh, 1,300 clauses and 16 schedules and 760 pages, the Companies Act is the longest act ever, 2006 Companies Act. It recognises that in writing includes communications and that e-communications are a normal way to do business, to communicate electronically with shareholders by email or via websites, to send out doc company documentation, to file at company's house, and so on. So this is an example of law adapting to technologies. One view is that cyberspace is moving us from a place of privacy, anonymity, and freedom to a place of control, identity, and regulation. Mark Rottenberg of the Electronic Privacy Information Center said, the cost of unlimited transparency will not simply be privacy, it will be autonomy, freedom, and individuality. The next area of IT law, or relevant to IT law, that I want to mention refers really to Microsoft, its competition law. <laughs> So this is representing multinational IT companies which have grown very fast. And an action was taken by the European Commission against Microsoft and also 
earlier and later other IT companies. IBM has had action in competition law. Intel has recently had action in competition law. And competition law in the UK and the EU exists to control certain types of anti-competitive, unfair market behaviour. And this is with the aim of creating an open and unified market throughout the EU to achieve fairness in the EU marketplace and to maintain the competitive position in the global economy and to avoid abuse by dominant companies <coughs> of their position. And the European Commission, the EU's regulator, is increasingly investigating potential anti-competitive practices in technology markets, especially in relation to access and interoperability. A company that is dominant in a particular market distorts the competitive structure in that market and would find no difficulty in making a competitor company's position untenable. A dominant company is therefore not legally permitted to take advantage of its market power to exploit those with whom it deals. This can occur with a dominant company's refusal to supply existing customers with products or excessive pricing or discriminatory terms. It's abuse of a dominant position. And dominant position relates to the particular market in which the company operates and the calculation of its market share including any other relevant factors such as technological knowledge or its um, sales network. Defining the market is not always easy, especially in a technology context. It may relate to a small market and specialised products. A company may be dominant where a market is dependent on its particular supplies such as spare parts or compatible products. However, there's no question of Microsoft's dominance. In 2004, it was found to have abused its dominant market position, following a complaint by Sun Microsystems in 1998. Microsoft had refused to supply interoperability information between Windows software and competing operating systems. Microsoft had also tied its Windows media player with the company's Windows 2000 PC operating system, that is making the sale of one product conditional on the purchase of another. And the effect of this was to stop competitors' activities in the market, effectively reducing consumer choice and increasing prices. So the European Commission required Microsoft to disclose full interface information to enable other workgroup servers to be interoperable with Windows PCs and servers and to keep the information up to date. Microsoft was ordered to end its unlawful tying practice and offer PC manufacturers two versions of its window client PC operating system, one being an unbundled alternative version without the Windows Media Player. And the EC, the, that's European Commission, fined Microsoft 497 million euros back in 2004. And that wasn't the maximum fine which could have been imposed, which would have been 10% of Microsoft's worldwide turnover. Naturally, Microsoft appealed both the decision itself and the fine, but it lost the appeal. In 2008, the Commission fined Microsoft 899 million euros for failure to comply with part of the orders in the original decision. It had done so, but at a price the Commission said was so exorbitant, it amounted to not complying. And that was the first time that a company had been fined for non-compliance with a decision, and it was the largest ever fine. Just now, the um, EU General Court has rejected Microsoft, just now, I mean in June, relatively just now, the EU um, rejected Microsoft's appeal against the 899 million euro fine, but it slightly reduced it to 860 million euros. <laughs> Finally, as the area of IT law that I'm going to discuss is crime, and arguably these are the areas that um, the landmarks and development in computers that have led to the adaptation and development of criminal law. 
Where people use computers to aid the commission of crime, then the difference is simply on the evidence. For example, the crime of inciting violent disorder during the city riots in the summer last year in the UK. A number of people post messages to Facebook to encourage rioting. For instance, one person specified a time and location for rioting in South Wales. A number of people joined his page. He didn't attend the location himself, and there was no evidence that anyone else had either to carry out violence. Nevertheless, he was jailed for four years, which was a similar sentence to that imposed on others who had incited disorder via social networks at the time of the riots. So I'm going really to discuss more examples of how the law has reacted to computer crime. The Computer Misuse Act 1990 came into force, it states, to make provision for securing computer material against unauthorised access or modification as criminal offences. So this covers hacking and deliberate corruption or destruction of data. And this was the first law in the UK to address computer misuse. And it was a reaction to a case where Robert Schifrin and Stephen Gold had hacked into British telecom systems but were charged under the Forgery and Counterfeiting Act. In 1988, the highest court, the House of Lords, upheld their acquittal. Lord David Brennan said, the Procrustean attempt to force these facts into the language of an act not designed to fit them produced grave difficulties for both judge and jury, which we would not wish to see repeated. The appellant's conduct amounted, in essence, to dishonestly gaining access to the relevant Prestel data bank by a trick that is not a criminal offence in 1988. If it is thought desirable to make it so, that is a matter for the legislature rather than the courts. So the legislature did so. The Act since been amended to cover attacks against computer data systems and networks and denial of service attacks as criminal offences, and supplying software tools or data to launch an attack is now also a criminal offence. The content of websites and other electronic communications may be illegal, for example by being racist, which is adapting existing law, or containing child pornography, which was new law specifically for online sites. It's a criminal offence to send any article which is indecent or grossly offensive, or which conveys a threat, or which is fault with an intent to cause distress or anxiety to the recipient. It may be committed by sending electronic messages as well as by more traditional hard copy writing or photographs. And the term trolling is used for emailing or posting online offensive communications in chat rooms and online forums. Someone was sentenced to 18 weeks imprisonment and banned from using social networking sites for five years for sending abusive messages on Facebook and YouTube, testimonial pages set up by family and friends for a teenager who killed herself after being bullied. So originally there was, there was legislation for sending articles, malicious communication, but it also has now has been adapted to apply to e-communications too. Terrorism is an offence of violence for political purposes, including violence for the purpose of advancing any political, religious, ideological or racial cause. It's also an offence to encourage terrorism or disseminate terrorist publications. The offence may be committed by a blogger or other person making a social media posting which encourages terrorism or disseminates terrorist publications. And there is specifically a notice and takedown regime for electronically published terrorist material. A notice may be served on an ISP or website hosting company requiring removal of the offending post within two days. Failure to remove the material without reasonable excuse means that the operator will get deemed to have endorsed the post and its directors could face up to seven years in prison. But ISPs and other intermediaries acting as mere conduits or who cache or host third-party content are protected if they host offending content, if they remove or block it once they learn that it's terrorist-related. Harassment is not a computer-specific crime, but I'm going to talk about a case of online harassment where the identity of the defendants was unknown. A mobile phone was stolen from a university student. 
It contained explicit sexual photographic images of her alone, taken for the personal use of her boyfriend at the time, and other images of her family and friends. The victim was contacted on Facebook by someone who made continued threats to post the images widely online, in spite of her deleting the messages and blocking the sender. Her father's pu business public relations team were also contacted and allegedly threatened and blackmailed about some images. An application was brought in the Specialist Technology and Construction Court for an interim injunction to prevent the transmission, storage and indexing of the photographic images taken from the phone on grounds of a right of privacy and the UK common law of confidentiality and to stop the harassment. But the applicant didn't know who was dealing electronically in the material. However, she was granted an anonymity order and she succeeded in her claims. She had a reasonable expectation of privacy. The users of the software who were electronically dealing in these digital images had no right to do so since the information was private and confidential and she had been caused harm and distress amounting to harassment. An expert on information technology law and cyber regulation, Professor Andrew Murray, who is a professor of law at the London School of Economics, gave evidence about the technology used. The digital images were uploaded to a free online Swedish media hosting service used for sharing images. The technology was BitTorrent, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing protocol used for distributing large amounts of data over the internet. Rather than downloading conventionally from a single source server, the BitTorrent protocol allows users to join others in a swarm to download and upload from each other simultaneously and therefore very quickly. Each user who downloads any piece of the file becomes a seeder facilitating the distribution of that piece so that pieces of the file may be uploaded by other users also downloading other pieces of that file. Files are created for uploading with a description, descriptor files, which in this case contain the claimant's name. The files are then distributed as normal by means of web pages, emails or mobile phones. The link to the BitTorrent files were at the top of the list of search engine searches for the claimant's name. Normally, a single source of the downloading could be identified and an order made against a single individual. With this technology, all the users who downloaded the files in this way needed to be identified. The expert demonstrated in court that the unique IP addresses of all the computers helping to share the images could be identified, and so the CEDAR's broadband providers could be contacted to establish their details, and the CEDAR's serve with the orders to delete the files and to be legally prevented from acting as CEDAR's and distributing the images. The evidence was that most of the CEDAR's were likely to be within the court's jurisdiction, and therefore, with the order made against them, the distribution of the files would stop. There was a need to move fast to prevent increasing number of cedars, and so the injunction was granted against persons unknown, identified as being any person who possessed any of the files containing the images. IT forensic experts would then be able to track them down to serve them with the order. So that's an example of the law procedure adapting. I'm going to illustrate liberty and security about with the law on data protect retention, another measure deriving from the EU to harmonise the retention of telecoms traffic data across the EU to assist law enforcement authorities to combat terrorism and serious crime. This is new law for IT, covering communications traffic data relating to internet access, internet email and internet telephony, as well as mobile and fixed line telephony. And it applies to traffic and location data to the use of electronic com communications, not the content which is expressly excluded. For example, who communicated with whom, when and for how long. Public telecoms companies and ISPs must keep records of all communications which they generate or process for at least 12 months so that law enforcement agents can access call, text, email and internet records by suspects. Australia is about to introduce similar legislation and there are discussions going on now uh, in the same way as there were 
in the UK about the desirability of this and the imposition on ISPs and all those kinds of things. There is increasing security legislation, including current proposals, which actually do interfere with our liberty, and it should be a question of the extent to which the interference is necessary and proportionate. And recent moves would go above and beyond EU law in the UK by retaining third party uh, communications data made through websites like Facebook and Gmail and so on. Malcolm Bradbury, a creative writer, gives a rather negative view of technology. He says, rather sadly, we no longer live in the age of reason. We don't have reason, we have computation. We don't have a tree of knowledge, we have an information superhighway. We don't have real intelligence, we have artificial intelligence. We no longer pursue truth, we seek data and signals. We no longer have philosophers, we have thinking pragmatists. But that is a rather negative view of things. And so in this presentation, I've considered the contrast between creativity and control, transparency and privacy, freedom and regulation, and liberty and security as the tensions as IT law has to adapt to ever-changing technology. Law has its own contrasts in certainly between legal jurisdiction and global technology, between being restricting and enabling, between adaptation and innovation, and between flexibility and certainty. However, change is endemic in the IT industry, and at the same time, IT itself is a continuing vehicle for process, it's become, uh, for progress, it's become ubiquitous and interactive. It reaches everyone now as an intrinsic part of everyday life. Similarly, law is not static or immutable and is always evolving, including responses to societal and cultural developments with commercial developments and a response to innovation. So IT and law are both dynamic, both constantly developing and constantly influencing each other. IT changes quickly and laws always do have to adjust to meet changing circumstances. I end any talk on IT law by saying that if I were to be giving the talk in a year's time, it would be different because there would be further cases a new legislation which would have changed the law. Oscar Wilde said, to be entirely free and at the same time entirely dominated by law is the eternal paradox of human life. So, thank you. <laughs>
so that cases are beginning to take longer and longer to get to court. So that's, that's one of the reasons. There would be time in assembling the evidence. Um, well, yes. <laughs> But, but it's to take into account that Microsoft was appealing against everything. So it appealed all the time in various ways. So there were, a, between 2004, which was when the decision was made, and six years, yes, that is a long time, but um, from 2004, Microsoft would have been consistently making its appeals and the decisions would have been being made. So there were, you know, every time there was a decision, it was appealed, and it wasn't appealed only on the decision; it was appealed on the amount of the fine and so on. But I'm not, I'm not explaining why it should take so long. I don't know. There's a certain irony as well because it sounds almost quaint talking about Windows Media Player because everybody's moved on from there. Yes. There are people that don't use anything to do with Microsoft anymore at all and access the internet on phones and what It's academic, isn't it, really? Well, yeah, and that's also one of the reasons why, to start with, there wasn't a lot of IT litigation, because by the time you got to court to argue over a contract, you were on to the next thing. Yes, yes. But where the sums involved are large, or the, not the principles involved, but it's usually the principles and the sums involved, um, then, then there will be litigation. This is more about clarification. Talking about ISPs being instructed to uh, take something down. Um, what happens if it's outside the EU and something rather nasty is put up on a website? Uh, can it be instructed in, in the UK or within the European Union to take down something that's offensive? Or if, if it's got an office within the jurisdiction of the EU, in fact, in the e European Economic Area, probably, yes. But this is the trouble with spam, that, you know, there are laws preventing spam, but, or, or, you know, telephone calls as well. If, they come from out, if it comes from outside the EU, then it's, it's not possible to do anything about it. No, but much. The people in the EU, EU, EU know that they're going to be in the trouble, so maybe all of it comes from outside now. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have heard a number of times to identifying perpetrators, bad guys, people who need to be stopped, whatever, via IP addresses. What is the current status of the law regarding linking a particular IP address to a particular person? Well, the case, the presumption will be, I guess, that um, the IP address, they, they will give the net. Now, it will be a defense for somebody to say, wasn't me, Garth, it was somebody else. Um, and then it will be a question of evidence. That is one of the arguments that's used about um, the identifying the online copyright infringers. Um, so on the same sort of topic, uh, the denial of services um, attempts which take place are very often uh, attributed to uh, zombie PCs. So, is there any technical way of, or any legal way of disconnecting something from the internet if it's discovered that they have been uh, got at and taken over in this way? Well, it would seem to be that there isn't, otherwise it would be done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but for a lot of these situations, um, the IP address will be that of the person who's, who's done whatever it was that they shouldn't be doing. Um, technical, I don't know. I can't tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
so that, that, um, that's right, yes. Um, again, a lot of the current legislation is bringing forward the idea of restricting people's access to the internet be, uh, due to some alleged or actual perpetration by them. On the other hand, one's ability to operate as a citizen is being increasingly uh, organised through the internet. The government have just announced that their new um, benefit system will operate entirely through the internet. Um, do you have an opinion on where the balance should lie between people's rights and abilities to obtain public services and act as a citizen against their being prevented from doing bad things? <laughs> Um, I think the, the, the court decisions, there's one in Belgium about, um, about whether, or, whether or not someone should have access to the internet. Actually, in Europe, and this is one of the things that is being discussed at EU level, that actually preventing people from access to the internet, the extent to which it would be proportionate. So I don't, I don't actually have an opinion on it, but it's something that the general discussion takes very much into account in how to stop people infringing copyright. Yeah, um, the snail's pace of prosecutions didn't really help in the verbal netscape. And the prosecutions that they had against Microsoft, I mean, the verbal effects went out of business, Netscape did go out of business, and whilst there was a settlement subsequently from Microsoft to the new owners of the Bell, it didn't help their company at all. But that's no. not my point. Um, I, I've done a lot of IP address research in the past, a lot of researching cases, and courts are more than happy to take um, IP addresses and associated log histories as proof of identity. I think there was a decision a while back. There's the, the Norwich Pharmacal order. There, there are ways in which, there's proper ways in which courts will make orders to, to find out the identity. And then it will be a defence if, if that person wasn't the person who had, if somebody else had used their computer, but you'd have to, it, it would be a question of presenting the evidence if that was the case. Yeah, I helped a, a blackmail case for a, um, for a FTSE and they successfully got a case. Um, my question is on um, log files. You said that people have to maintain log files of transactions. Is there any transactions that affect them or transactions that um, traverse their infrastructure? Because a year is a huge amount of data for an ISP to keep, and, and, and the law really is there. Yeah, um, it was six months originally. I think the EU directive actually gave a range of time that each country could incorporate it. I, I believe it's 12 months. Is that stuff um, that traverses them though, or, or stuff that directly affects them? So where a user accesses a website mm -hmm. in the Far East, it's the providers who have to maintain the information. It's not. It's not you and me individually. I understand that. But the tracing the data and providing log files of all the transactions that go on is an onerous responsibility. I mean, it's hmm. almost impossible. I mean, I know security agencies that oh. are struggling to do that. Well, is it? Yes. I mean, exactly. Is it the first um, one? The, the, the first uh, route that we can go through. The next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Because you obviously go through, you know, to get to the forest, you go through 20 routes. Well, yeah, how many of those routes have to maintain mm -hmm. the logs? Um, it's, uh, you know, well, no, I mean, it's just that I don't think that either the government or the um, law courts in Britain have, any, have a, a sufficient level of knowledge and understanding of uh, these technical issues. I mean, when I look at legal cases in America, uh, you, you read the um, judges, judgments in American courts, uh, where the American courts clearly have a very good, very deep understanding of, of what the technology is, and their judgments reflect that. Um, I haven't seen any judgments in England that reflect any, any great knowledge. And, and obviously, um, nobody in Parliament has the least idea. Oh, <laughs> say exactly the same as you've just said, the ISP has to keep information. Well, ISPs hardly exist, are existing less and less, particularly when it's telephones now, it's not ISPs. Uh, it, it, it becomes entirely meaningless. My question, 
sorry, if I make, I need the router circuit within 30 million packets a second. <laughs> well, and of course the problem the, 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 the problem is that of course what they want is um, the email address where it's gone from and to, and yes. if your router has only got 10 of the 20 packets that contain <laughs> the uh, email address, it's impossible because you've got to actually assemble all 20 packets out of the 100 that constitute the email. Um, in order to do it. So, I mean, it's absolute nonsense, and I don't really understand why I, why it's not being discussed in a, in, a, in a context that makes sense. The, the ISPs would have lobbied at the time, well, not would have, they did. Um, and I don't know, and I haven't got it with me, what the actual wording of the regulation says, which would presumably answer your question. Yeah. But has it actually gone through? Oh, yeah. It's, it's an EU direct, another EU directive. It went through in two tranches. My, my, my question was to go back to, to uh, um, intellectual IPR. Um, and you were talking about um, patents and copyright um, and how those are sort of varied. If we'd been having this conversation, what was it, 10 years ago or something, uh, we'd actually been also talking uh, about trade secret because the whole of the Unix empire was protected by trade secret rather than by either patent or copyright. Um, has that now gone completely away with um, Novell? And the, I, I mean, I've lost track of how many of the Unix uh, rights holders are still in existence because, of course, now it's no longer Unix, it's now Linux, which is supposedly free of any intellectual property from um, from the, the Unix um, world, um, but it's clearly not free of um, some of the trade secrets of, of I, I don't think that it would be claimed to be free of the trade secrets, and I'm just not clear whether um, uh, there are still indemnities held against um, Linux, again, uh, well, Linux still holds indemnities against Unix or not. Uh, what is the situation with um, Unix and uh, protection? I don't know, but a lot of it would be in the States, which is different in any case. But, but trade secrets, are, or keeping something secret, is an alternative to a patent. That's, that's a, it's a question of recipes are normally trade secrets. The recipe for chartreuse, you know, held by three months throughout the centuries, all the time, uh, but it's it's whether a patent and a, a patented invention where you have to publicise and you get the twenty year protection, but the Coca but after the twenty years, it's available for anybody. Whereas Coca Cola, if it had patented its its formula for you know, they'd be copying it all over the place. Um, so that that is one decision on on patenting. Um, and I just I don't know specifically about units on a or anything else, but I do I should say in the States anything can be patented by comparison with the UK and Europe. Hello. Just a, a, a point about this business of perhaps not being technically savvy enough. Um, there was a, an antitrust case against IBM which concentrated on the IBM 360 as being a big machine, as being their big market. What they didn't notice was that the antitrust legislation didn't cover the System 38 and the smaller machines, which were worth about three times as much. So that there the does, in the legal side of it, need to be an appreciation both of the technology and the market, which isn't always there, which I think is illustrated by the last point. Actually, also, with patents, um, our patent courts are, with software which does have a technical effect, or whatever, um, our patent courts are very good, and the judges there would have the knowledge or, or would be advised. And there is greater knowledge now with the Technology and Construction Court where some of the IT cases go to. And also, um, judges... Um, accept evidence and for anything that was technological that, that relied on that for, for its case, there would be expert witnesses 
and it would be a ca case of, of presenting the evidence so that the court did understand it. Sorry, but yeah, well, it's a question of understanding. I mean, it's not a question of just listening to the experts. It's a question of unpicking the various experts. I mean, if a colleague of mine might have said, well, in, in that interesting case there, I'd be happy to be an expert. I'd be very happy to be an expert on either side. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you should be. Um, this is more of a comparison of time scales and events um, rather than a question. Sorry about that, Rachel. The, in, back in 1975, I was loosely involved in uh, where an outside company had gone to the law to get a 1900 internal interface uh, specification out of ICL because they wanted to sell part of our systems cheaper. Because we had an overall price for our whole system with all its support and everything, and they wanted to pick into it. It ruled against ICL uh, in the end, and uh, while well, I still saw about it, I just produced a specification which didn't actually exist before that, so we just had some wires. Um, but that result was a matter of, was an English court, it was a matter of weeks, and we were told, you have to do it. So I'm just saying how the comparison was with Microsoft in 14 years, is it? Well, it, all, it may also be, and I don't, I really don't know, but if you're wanting not to pay a fine or to have something overturned, it's possible that it might be in your interest not to move very fast. <laughs> in the hope, in the time we got to court, it was irrelevant as, as early in the stage. Or, or it's called kicking the can down the road. What you do with the with the euro? Well, uh, that relates to the very famous case of the, the IBM antitrust case, uh, where all IBM yeah, yeah. Uh, relates to the IBM antitrust case, where um, famously all of the IBM offices were instructed um, to put every piece of paper make every piece of paper that they produced available to the um, antitrust. Um, offices. Um, so IBM had to hire every office building in whatever town it was where they were pursuing the case, um, merely to take the lorry loads of paper that arrived every day <laughs> containing everything, whether it was relevant or not. Because IBM just said, well, you wanted us to be honest and open and provide you with all this information? Well, here you are. Everything that's ever been produced in this land. I think I think you, you might find that that would be stopped now because, as you can imagine, not necessarily IBM, but any case where you've got email trails and documentation to go through can be a phenomenal amount of paper. And part of the disclosure process, which takes place much earlier now in cases, um, does have to be what's relevant. Frightened me to death in the first few slides. But you did mention normal salesman exaggeration was okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, take a, I'll take a card. <laughs> um, this is, um, there was a lot of publicity about the failed NHS um, computer system. 
And what struck me reading completely as an outsider, the uh, newspaper reports, is what appeared to be a complete absence of any form of comeback on the part of government to the American suppliers. I wonder if you can say something about what the nature of that, I think it was, I don't know, several hundred billions or something. Um, and it seemed like a failed system, which wasn't delivered, and it seemed that there was very little comeback that the government had to, uh, there, was, there seemed to be no mechanism of redress, which, which struck me as peculiar. It strikes me as peculiar, and I really don't understand it. That, well, there, there is a case, there's a case, of, there are a few cases involving ICL, <laughs> and, and there was one with, um, against the, well, the cooperative uh, society brought the case for, um, they, they'd failed to get their, their systems that, that ICL had promised them, and the case turned on whether or not there was a contract. And the case, the judge found that there wasn't a contract. Actually, courts try very hard to find there's a contract. But the, the judge at first instance, in the first level of case, he said there wasn't a contract. So naturally, it got appealed. But it wasn't an appeal about the merits or otherwise of the case. It was whether or not there was a contract. And the court of appeal really criticized the judge that there, that for saying there wasn't a contract and sent the case back again, by which time, it's not cheap to take a case up as far as the Court of Appeal. So they've been first level, they've been to Court of Appeal, and they're still arguing about whether there's a contract, not about the amount that should have been paid or not for the system not being delivered. So it happens with companies of all sizes. I say a word, but these large, large government contracts and Durham's comments about a lot of the difficulty arises because the original IT T and the spec for the system would have a certain set of ideas and then a certain set of requirements. But then they move very quickly. The, the, all sorts of changes get uh, arise from the, the, the customer wants them, the supplier encourages them. So the thing moves and moves. So the contract, well, there's a, quite a business in contract change control that uh, goes on with, government, with large government contracts, but it gets so involved that I would think it's not not uh, clear cut to, to demand damages of uh, such and such. You you have employed high power consultants to run the thing, and uh, they would claim they were taking the best advice from their uh, from the people in the civil service that they were dealing with? I, one, of, one of the points with, um, that does arise sometimes with some government contracts, allegedly, is that <laughs> it's the lowest, they go on fixed price, the lowest price possible. And so suppliers will take them on knowing that changes will be made and that they will make their money because of the inevitable changes that arise. But nevertheless, a contract that's properly negotiated should have change control procedures which aren't so bureaucratic that nobody takes any notice of them, and should have it, any contract should, um, for d delivery of an IT system should be modular so that it's stage by stage deliverable. But, the, but it that all, that doesn't always happen. We're rather glad to see at the end. Hang on, Dan. Sorry, oh. Started. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, I've got the microphone. Um, I don't know the at the end of a, a, a case, I think it was Samsung the other day, decided that they would pay the fine to Apple in copper coins. <laughs> and about 40 trucks full of cents turned up and tipped the amount of the fine onto the forecourt of the Apple office. I'm glad to see that the negotiable cow is still alive and kicking in IT. Can I just ask, this, 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 there have some, been some cases where the NHS particularly, which I know about, has fallen out with the supplier and they've gone to court and, agree, and eventually settled with an agreement that effectively neither of them talks about it anymore. There's no, <laughs> there is no press coverage or anything. It's all done in confidence. Is that, is that the end of it then? Is there, there's no precedent then at all? It's, it's not something that lawyers can use? Or? 
Oh, uh, well, sorry, Loyard, it depends. But <laughs> most cases settle. Mm. And the changes that were brought in by Lord Wolfe some years ago um, enhance that, that, that parties are encouraged to settle rather than, and few, about 5% of cases that start actually ever get to court, never mind going up to the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court. Um, but when they settle, and sometimes there was a very big, I think it was IBM and Cable and Wireless a few years ago, an outsourcing contract, which was heralded with, you know, what a wonderful contract it was and what was going to happen. And then it all went wrong within three or four years. Um, and neither side actually wanted everything exposed, mm -hmm. I imagine. Mm -hmm. And so that's another reason why cases will settle. And they may settle, they may very well settle on confidential terms. But the settlement is no precedent, is it? No, the settlement wouldn't be a precedent. Uh, Just about privacy, um, isn't the sort of balance really very unfair between the corporations and the lawyers and the individual on privacy? I'm thinking of things like the um, Facebook privacy uh, um, settings that you can set, which are incredibly complicated. I mean, I know they've, they've said they've simplified them, but they're incredibly complicated and so complicated that it's unlikely that people could understand them. And this new rule about um, cookies, uh, where you're, you're supposed to be told what the cookies are about. Well, most people um, just say, uh, most websites now just say, um, click here to accept cookies. If you want to read about cookies, um, <coughs> click on this link to cookie dollar information, which just tells you cookies are cookies and doesn't tell you what they're for. There's no indication of, of what the cookies are actually used for. And the only place I've ever seen an explanation is on the um, the register site, uh, the, the IT news site called the register, um, which actually has an explanation of every single cookie that they use, what it's used for, when it's how long its lifetime is, and so on. And there, you actually have a, an opportunity of, of making a, a reasoned assessment. Everywhere else, you can't possibly make a reasoned assessment because there's no information about it, and anyway, it's too complicated. Where should the balance be set? Right, that's that's going from unfair, and law isn't necessarily about fairness, so that's that's the main thing. Um, but the second thing, or oh, it doesn't succeed in being about fairness. But as the cookies law is, it's not actually new because you should always, not always, since for about nine years, strictly speaking, um, visitors to websites should have chosen to opt in, including cookies. It's just that um, the information commissioner a year ago actually decided um, that, that something had to be done about it. Um, but as far as, as far as the cookies are concerned, um, the general public is not very well informed about cookies anyway and eventually there's going to be sufficient technology that it will be much easier for them to opt, to opt in much more simply than having these little pop-up banners and goodness knows what. But actually most, most users, if to websites, just want, they're quite happy to know that the information is going to be kept because they want to visit the website for whatever purpose it is. So I don't... I don't That's not the point. It's when it's it's when it's kept to pass on to some third party marketing organisation. That's a different issue. You don't have any choice. No, no, you're supposed to have what you yeah. I, I think there is. So. Not, oh, also. No, it's definitely. Uh, it, you, in fact, the new director, Roy Devotion, I was at a session yesterday in Sandy Gray. Uh, the new regulation specifically says that. Not, it, there, 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 to, it's got to be explicit. Yes, I, I but it does it by linking to another another website because it doesn't it mostly. But in any case, I mean, if you look at your Nectar card, Sainsbury's can use the information for anything, but people still accept it. Uh, I think 
um, as I recall, the information commissioner has actually said that you have explicitly to do something to opt in, and that the increasing uh, messages you're seeing now are saying this site uses cookies. Full stop. That's it. Once you're on the site, you are cookied. Um, is not it seems to me not to be doing what the information commissioner demands. That's Wait, let, let's see it, whether they actually pursue some of those from the bigger sites. Yeah, but, but the, certainly the, the cookies that, that where information will be passed on to third parties, that's different. But there, are, there's, um, there is, there is a, a guide to the four different kinds of cookies, and the ones which are essentially don't need permission for, and then the fourth one where you are passing the information on. But it, it is... It's just that people have to be alerted to the fact that their personal information is being held in this way to accept it. Rachel, I think uh, it's perhaps the point at which to draw uh, a fascinating afternoon to a close and to uh, thank you for your talk and for dealing with the uh, wide range of questions that people have had for you. I, I have a couple of quick notices. Um, those of you on our emailing list will have heard the sad news of the death of Brian Oakley, who was a past chairman of the Computer Conservation Society and a distinguished public servant uh, in the area of uh, IT, amongst others. Um, there is uh, going to be a public uh, celebration of his life. Um, we'd hope to have final details of that today. Um, we haven't got those yet. Uh, we hope to have them very soon. We will send them to you. It will be an event held in central London. Uh, one of the dates that has been mentioned in connection with that event uh, is November the 15th, which is the day of our November meeting. Uh, the idea was to hold the meeting uh, perhaps starting late in the afternoon. Um, if that were to go ahead at that time, uh, we may change the start time of our afternoon meeting. Uh, and make it a little earlier so that it will be possible for you to both attend uh, the lecture here and then attend uh, the meeting which is provisionally at the BCS but uh, again that also may be subject to change. So can I just first of all share with you uh, the, 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 the sad news of Brian's passing uh, but also just to say uh, please look carefully at the next couple of emailings from us about meetings. I will endeavour to highlight a change of time uh, if that happens, and I will most certainly email you the details of the uh, celebration of Brian's life, uh, whether or not it corresponds, uh, coincides uh, with one of our meetings. Um, our next meeting uh, in roughly four weeks' time will be on October the 18th. I will give you a health warning, it includes the AGM, which will no doubt, Rachel, be conducted as briefly and rapidly as is legally possible. Um, the AGM, as you know, starts at 2 o'clock, so as not to spoil the rest of the afternoon, which starts at 2.30. Um, the meeting promises to be an interesting one. We're bringing together three uh, practitioners in the area of conservation. And we are going to discuss, uh, the title is Conserving the Past for the Future, and look at the issues of conserving data, websites, and software. This group uh, has its origins in the conservation of hardware, and we are still uh, running numerous uh, working parties conserving uh, machines, and it's important that we do. But if we uh, are to understand the context in which those machines work, then it's important that we conserve and are able to run in some way uh, software, 
data, which implies obviously software, and also the conservation now of the uh, ubiquitous websites. Uh, the, these are important historic artifacts. So the three speakers, uh, Tim Gollins from the National Archive, Jeremy John from the British Library, and David Holdsworth of the CCS. And that promises to be a very interesting afternoon as we try and uh, look at the different issues uh, relating to it. The November meeting, which I, I mentioned in passing, uh, is the history of machine translation. Uh, and the, the, the history of machine translation goes back to the very early days of computing. And John Hutchins, uh, retired now from the University of East Anglia, and uh, someone who's written uh, quite widely on uh, machine translation over the years, uh, an expert in that area, uh, he will be talking to us. And uh, just for completeness, December the 13th, there will be, all being well, a film show. Uh, we are, uh, Kevin and I and Dan are grappling around once again in the back of those very dusty old cupboards, uh, looking for old films uh, to show you uh, for, the, for the December meeting. So um, October the 18th is the next meeting, and I look forward to seeing you all there, uh, conserving the past for the future, data, websites, and software. So once again, Rachel, our thanks once again to you for a fascinating afternoon, and I look forward to seeing everybody in October. Thank you.